I'm going live, babe. I'm on, I'm on my video right now, okay? Are you, are you I'm, on, I'm live right now. Oh. I'm recording right now. Hey, guys, what's up? <laughs> hey, so I got a question here uh, on one of my YouTube uh, comments. It says, um, hey, I'm struggling deciding which medications I should give and how to deliver. Can you please make a video over that? So here I am today. I'm going to make a video over that. Which medication to give and how to give it, okay? That's a, that's a common uh, basic pharmacology question that's important. You need to know which medications to give and how to give them for certain circumstances because far too often we give the wrong medication for the wrong situation, okay? And so you're going to want to know this stuff. You're going to want to learn it, and you're going to want to be able to, to revert back to it and trust your knowledge base when you have to make a clinical decision. So I've got some bullet points on here on the board. These are um, Some of them are just classifications of medications. Some of them are actual medication names I broke this down like this because I think for me this makes the most sense okay so uh, we're gonna do it this way if it doesn't make sense then obviously leave me your comments below and I'll clarify as best I can okay so the first bullet point up there is when do I give a Saba verse a lava now you got to understand what a Saba is and you have to understand what a lava is. Now, if you weren't taught it this way, then you're thinking to yourself, what the hell is a saba or a lava? So saba stands for short-acting beta adrenergic. Lava stands for long-acting beta adrenergic, okay? So when we talk about saba, there's a lot of them, but there's two primary ones we give today, and that is albuterol and levalbuterol, being Zopinex. Okay, so those are our two primary sabas that you see in use today. Okay, when we talk about lavas or our long acting beta adrenergics, you're really talking about salmeterol, which is cerevent, fermoterol, which is performist or foradil, depending on which form it's in, and then or fermoterol, which is which is bravana. Okay, now. The LAVAs, and this is the way I try to tell my students to understand these medications, is that when you talk about your LAVAs, they should not be in the emergency department. Okay, There should never be a day where you're working the emergency department and a patient comes in shut down, status asthmaticus, or they can't breathe, they have really tight wheezes bilaterally, and you say, let me give them a lava, let me give them Perforamist, or let me give them Bravana, or let me give them Cimeterol. That's, that's the wrong answer. Okay, because your lavas are for maintenance. Those are the medications that you should be getting in your patient, sending them home on, and say, do these twice a day. Okay, now your sabas, on the other hand, are your Q4 to Q6 drugs. This is albuterol and Zopinex. These are the drugs that you want in your emergency department when that patient comes in and is shut down and they need a breathing treatment to get them opened up fast, okay? So that's the first thing you need to understand. Saba versus Lava. Short acting is in your emergency department. You're probably gonna give these most oftentimes via small volume nebulizer. That's your Arbuterol and your Zopinex. People go home on these and they use them when they need them at home, and they may do them MDI form, okay? That's usually the typical home form is MDI. But we're in the hospital in an emergency setting. Typically, we're going to give them a small volume nebulizer. Now, when it comes to your LAVAs, these are what you really need to educate for the end game at home, okay? These are their maintenance medications. So if a patient goes home on salmeterol, being cerevent, for motorol, which is performist or foradil. You got to understand the difference between these two. Performist is going to be given SVN, okay? It's its aqueous solution of formoterol. The MDI version, which is actually a DPI version of formoterol, is foradil, okay? And then the last one is our formoterol, which is bravana, which only comes in an aqueous solution. So you're obviously going to give it small volume nebulizer. Okay, now the second drug I have listed up here is anticholinergic. You're going to want to know when to give these. And the only indication for these, there's two indications for these drugs. You give these drugs when you have, when you desire to administer um, maintenance medication for your COPD patients. 
or acute relief of status asthmaticus when the Saba isn't working by itself. Okay? So when do I go to do an EB? When albuterol by itself is not working. And, and I will add in an anticholinergic, which in that case would be and bromide. Now, if you want to add it for maintenance therapy for your COPD patients, then you could do and bromide or possibly and bromide, okay, which is the once a day DPI. Okay, it comes with the egg. You have to puncture the egg. The patient inhales on it fast and deep. And you give the medication that away. Okay. Opertropin bromide is available in an aqueous solution where you give it via small volume nebulizer, or it comes in a MDI that in dual, I mean not dual neb, that's the that's the aqueous solution. The MDI version in conjunction with albuterol is called Combavent. Okay. Or you can just get an atrovin or an apotropin bromide MDI by itself. Okay, so so there's lots of different ways to give it. So you just need to know how it's available and how can I give it. Okay, now the next bullet point I have on here is inhaled corticosteroids. So here we're talking about budesonide, okay, for motorol, uh, mometasone. There's lots of different inhaled corticosteroids. All of their indications are the same. Any disease process that presents with chronic inflammation of the airways, you would... Think, let me give an inhaled corticosteroids to reduce inflammation. Okay, now what you need to know about these steroids is that most of them are available in MDI or DPI form. Okay, budesonide, being pomacort, is your oddball in this case because pomacort is available in an aqueous solution that you can give via SVN. Okay, so that's what makes Pomacort a little different than the rest of them, is that it's available to be nebulized via SVN. Okay, now the next bullet point you see is Mucomist versus Pomazyme. You know both of these are mucoactive drugs. They're going to break down mucus and the properties of mucus, but they're very different in how they do that. Okay, so Mucomist breaks down the disulfide bonds in mucus. Okay where pomazine breaks down the DNA structure of mucus. What does this mean to me as a respiratory therapist and why do I need to know it? It's simply this. If your patient presents with cystic fibrosis and in some cases bronchiectasis, then you should be thinking pomazine. If your patient presents with any other disease process that results in thick and cissipated mucus, okay, then you need to be thinking Mucomist. That's it. It's as simple as that. CF, bronchiectasis, pomazine, everything else, mucomist. Okay? Now, what you have to remember is when you give mucomist, you always have to give it with a Saba, a short acting beta adrenergic. So, you should never give mucomist by itself because it has a very strong uh, property that can cause bronchoconstriction. So you want to bronchodilate while giving the mucomist, okay? That's what you need to know about mucomist and pomazyme, okay? The next one up here is Toby. When I say Toby, I'm talking about tobramycin. This is an inhaled antibiotic that's recommended for the chronic treatment of recurring Pseudomonas aeruginosa in CF patients. So this is a drug that you will oftentimes see your CF patients on, okay? Now this is a 30-day drug. They're on it for 30 days and they have to be off of it for 30 days, okay? In clinical practice, you may see them on this drug for 30 days and then go off of it and go on to Casten, which is another inhaled antibiotic for the same reason, for 30 days. And then go off of Casten and then go back on the Toby, okay? That's what Toby is. You need to give it with a perineb um, of some sort, um, so that uh, the maximize um, deposition of the drug and reduce exposure uh, to everybody else. Now, the next one on there is ribavirin. This is a drug that we're not seeing given a whole lot anymore, but your board exams like to throw it in there occasionally. Here's what you need to think about ribavirin. You think ribavirin, you think small particle aerosol generator. So ribavirin, SPAG, why do I give it? For the treatment of RSV. Okay, so that's as simple as that. Ribavirin, 
SPAG, RSV, and no pregnant women taking care of this patient, or at least given this medication, okay? So that's ribavirin. I'm going to slide over here to pentamidine, okay? Pentamidine is a drug that we treat, that we give to treat PCP pneumonia in our HIV patient, okay? So when you think, when you think ribavirin, you think RSV, you think SPAG, no pregnant people. When you think pentamidine, you think PCP pneumonia, <laughs> HIV, and you want to give this with the UltraGuard 2 nebulizer, which is used, again, to reduce caregiver exposure to the drug, and you want to use a scavenger unit. Okay, so those are some key words that go with pentamidine in the treatment of PCP pneumonia associated with your HIV patients. Okay, and then the last one I have on here is Lasix, which is not in theory an aerosolized or a, or a respiratory care drug, but it's a big drug that we need to know how to recommend and how to give because you're going to get called to a room one day for a patient that presents with wheezing and you're going to listen to them and they're going to wheeze and you're going to give them a treatment, and they're still going to wheeze, okay? And the reason that's happening is because the wheezes are associated with fluid on the lungs, not by bronchoconstriction, okay? If it's bronchoconstriction, in most cases, they'll respond to the albuterol or the Zopinex or the short-acting beta-adrenergic. But in this case, this patient doesn't respond. So what do you do? You give them another treatment, and they still don't respond. So what do you do? You may give them another treatment and they still don't respond. A nurse may call you every hour for three or four hours asking you for another treatment saying my patient's wheezing. And it's not going to be until you look at the fluid intake and output and realize that the patient is 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 liters positive with a history of congestive heart failure that you go, you know what? I think we need to give this patient Lasix, not so much albuterol. Okay? And in that case, you call the doctor. Don't ask the nurse to. You call the doc and say, hey, doc, patient's fluid overloaded. I, the, the albuterol treatments are not working. Patient is not responding. And so I'd like to see if we could give this patient, you know, maybe 40 of Lasix and see if, if they improve from that. Okay? And that's the day that you'll go from feeling like a rookie respiratory therapist to a valued, experienced respiratory therapist where you go, I think I made a good call today. I think I did something that actually impacted my patient other than giving breathing treatments that don't seem to have much impact on my patients. Okay, So there we have it. If there's another drug out there that I didn't touch on this, I didn't talk about pain medication or your narcotics or your opioids. I didn't talk about your benzodiazepines. I didn't talk about your paralyzing agents. I can. Paralyzing agents, if you're going to use one of them to promote or to facilitate intubation and you need to be thinking succinylcholine which is a nectine brand name it's a very short acting paralyzing agent often used to facilitate intubation okay your rest of them rocuronium vecuronium nimbex all of those are typically used for long term paralyzing effects um, to promote and to better enhance mechanical ventilation and overall treatment of your patient your benzos you're talking about versed propofol presidex um, Ativan, Xanax, Valium, all they do is re reduce anxiety from your patient. Your pain medications being your narcotics and your opioids, the two big ones, or morphine and fentanyl. Okay, there's other ones, but I'm just going to touch on those. Okay, what you need to know about benzos and morphine, I mean in pain meds, is that they can reduce your patient's drive to breathe. So what drugs would you give to reverse the effects of pain medicines versus benzos. If it's a pain medicine issue and you think they've received too much pain medicine, okay, then you want to give Narcan to reverse those effects. Okay? If it's benzos overdose, then you may could try giving Ramazicon to reverse those effects. Okay? Those are drugs that kind of are beyond our scope, but still very important to your knowledge base to understand the effects they have on your patient and what we can do to reverse them, okay? If I didn't touch on a specific drug that you're hung up on, okay, to the person that asked me this question, then I want you very specifically to put it in the comments and say, hey, you didn't touch on this, clarify it for me, 
Okay, for the rest of you, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned. And I hope you're having a fun time learning how to become a respiratory therapist. We'll be in touch soon.